Our next speaker is uh, Donald Kalor, and he's the executive director of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Originally from Charlottetown, Donald has worked in Costa Rica, in the Costa Rica rainforest, uh, the coral reefs of the Bahamas, and the Bay of Fundy before returning to PEI to lead the PEIFA, Federation of Agriculture. Donald is passionate about incorporating sustainability into existing systems ensuring that the economic, environmental, and social benefits are considered in multi-stakeholder approaches to strategic planning and action. So that brings very close to some of the discussions we've had here at the Woodlot Owners Association as well. Recently, um, we have a new representative from uh, our Woodlot Owners Association board who will sit as uh, the member on, uh, as a board member on the PEI Federation of Agriculture, and that's Judy Shaw up front here. And I'll just give you just a little bit uh, of uh, information on, on Judy here as well. Uh, prior to returning to PEI in 2012, Judy was the head of government and corporate affairs for Syngenta Canada, an agribusiness committed to sustainable agriculture. Um, she graduated from the University of Guelph and uh, has been involved in regulatory affairs, government affairs, media relations, industry relations and public affairs for Syngenta and its uh, other legacy companies. And she's also worked for the Global Syngenta head office in, in Switzerland. Um, and she served as the chair of the Canadian Business and Biodiversity Council, president of Can Canadian 4-H Council, Chair of the Pest Management Center of, for Pest Management Center Risk Reduction, Minor Use Programs Advisory Committee, and the President of the, uh, the Canadian Agriculture Hall of Fame. We're quite honored to have you as a board member, Judy, and we're very glad that you're going to be uh, our voice uh, at the table for the PIFA. Without further ado, I uh, will welcome Donald here to the to the podium here. Thank you, Barry. I should uh, be so fortunate to always have someone as successful to have their bio right before I come up here. That's actually really helpful. Maybe I'll just steal that with Judy and just use yours from now on. It seems like it's a lot more relevant to agriculture than mine. Um, I do appreciate Judy's been to one meeting now, and it comes on the back of a, a really good meeting with Barry and Kathy and John Rowe as well to help me better understand the organization and what we can do at the PEIFA. Uh, to support woodlot owners in Prince Edward Island. Uh, there's a few items uh, I wanted to highlight and then I'm going to run through a few slides that um, talk a little bit more about agriculture and what we're working on, but um, really I think we've dealt a lot this year with pressure on land. Um, we've seen dramatic decreases in um, the amount of farmland in Prince Edward Island over the last five years. And I think that's one example of many where resource land, forestry and agriculture land uh, where the needs of those um, overlap. And so what we advocate for at the Federation of Agriculture is a uh, province-wide land use plan. And what we'd like to see in the resulting plan specifically is both forestry and agricultural land set aside as resource land and uh, treated with um, great care uh, in deference to the importance of those types of landscapes uh, to our well-being and our economy on Prince Edward Island. So we do hope to see progress on that. Um, <coughs> progress would I would characterize as slow and not necessarily steady thus far, but um, we're hoping now with the new government, uh, which is the same as the old government, but nonetheless we hope that progress will, will improve and that we can um, adopt policies both in our municipalities and surrounding areas that alleviate that pressure, that development pressure um, that we see on our, uh, on our resource land. That, and, and, and you know, our, our, our members are your members, you know, our members are the woodlot owners as well. Um, the members of the PEIFA, I don't know the stats, but uh, own a tremendous amount of woodlot across Prince Edward Island. And that land is held in, you know, they manage that land. Some of them think of it as sort of reserve farmland. And we, we have to, over the next, you know, over the coming years, we have to incentivize a change in that thinking, help them understand uh, help them understand the value of that land, 
uh, standing as forest and also help them improve their yields on their existing farmland so that um, the need, the economic need to clear that land can be alleviated. Um, when we talk about climate change, Brad mentioned co climate change adaptation. I'll talk about adaptation and mitigation a little bit. Adaptation is our ability to deal with um, these dramatic uh, changes to our, uh, to our climate, the increased frequency and, and severity of storm events uh, in agriculture. You know, drought impacts us greatly, changes to our precipitation patterns in general. Um, we are working um, to develop a climate change adaptation plan for our industry. Uh, I know that when we discuss adaptation, we talk about um, commodity specific adaptations we can adapt, but we also think hard about generally, if we're gonna build resilience over time scales like 40 years, 60 years, um, we can't necessarily be always thinking at the field scale, we have to think at the provincial scale. And, and trees and how trees are incorporated into the agricultural landscape are a very important part of that. Agroforestry consistently grades out as, as an item you know, that uh, shows great promise to build resilience in our landscapes and for our industry. So the way that we use trees uh, will evolve post Fiona. Uh, hedgerows are something that are critical to our industry uh, and the resilience of it. And what we've learned is that our hedgerows weren't, weren't designed properly. And as a result, Fiona took a tremendous toll on them. Um, our riparian zones um, have to be uh, similar. They have to be maintained and ensure that they have a uh, a, a resilient makeup to allow our, uh, those critical um, buffer zones to be able to survive a, a storm like Fiona. And so, you know, trees become an important piece of the, of the adaptation plan uh, for agriculture. And, um, you know, there are exciting opportunities as well to, to interplant trees amongst cropland that we'll explore more. It will require research to understand how those can best be implemented on Prince Edward Island. But there's no question that trees will play a critical role in building resilience in the agriculture industry to climate change and its effects over the next 40, 40 to 60 years. Which brings us to really the biggest opportunity, I think, for um, agriculture and, and the woodlot owners to work together, and that's about carbon. It's about the mitigation of climate change, uh, the removal of carbon from the atmosphere, um, and how we're gonna get that done. And uh, I was pleased this week, actually, I was invited to speak uh, to the Senate um, of Canada, of all places, um, this week about carbon and how we're gonna, how we're gonna use agriculture to, to deal with it. And so this, this is sort of my, um, that'll kind of be, this is kind of the main event and then that'll be something I do later this week just as a follow up. So, um, but carbon, our, our opportunity in carbon is so similar between the woodlot owners and, and the agriculture industry that it only made sense to try and build significant bridges between the two efforts. These two efforts are emerging simultaneously on Prince Edward Island. The effort to capitalize carbon in both our woodlots and our agricultural landscapes uh, represent tremendous opportunities for your members and uh, for the members of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. These landscape features are critical in the effort to reach net zero both in Prince Edward Island, across the country, and around the globe. And uh, we have to be able to sequester carbon at a, at a dramatic pace in order to uh, alleviate some of these impacts on climate change. This is something I'm really passionate about. I could talk about it. I mean, I, I, I talk about carbon just on and on about it. Um, I'm excited to have, I've been at the PEI Federation of Agriculture now for about 18 months, and I'm excited to have put us in a position to manage our carbon and to reduce it. And the marketplace will play a part in that. Carbon is our newest commodity. We will farm carbon on Prince Edward Island, and we will do our best to sell it to the highest bidder. And uh, that's, that's our goal, is to, um, is to develop strategies, to develop information so that our members can make decisions about who they sell their carbon to, um, how to develop it, how to market it, and ultimately how to get it to the marketplace uh, and get them the best price they can. So we, we, we're determined to work with woodlot owners, we're determined to work simultaneously so that when a, uh, a farmer comes to us who wants to participate in carbon markets, uh, we can deal with both their agricultural landscape and their, and their forest landscapes simultaneously. Uh, the, the way that carbon projects work, the way that you develop carbon credits, they will be split into two different projects, but um, the goal is for um, all of this sequestered carbon from Prince Edward Island to be branded and marketed, um, and so that the marketplace understands that this commodity 
uh, is of the highest quality and it's been developed with a total landscape approach um, so that um, people aren't sort of sequestering carbon in one place and, and destroying it in another. So this holistic approach will ensure that we develop a premium product on Prince Edward Island and uh, I look forward to working with um, four stakeholders as part of that over the coming months and, and really years. And so the, that's really exciting. Forest carbon is a little bit better understood than soil carbon. Uh, there are more, perhaps more marketplace opportunities. Uh, we really have two types of marketplaces, voluntary markets and regulated markets. Today, opportunities for soil carbon exist only in voluntary markets in Canada. Uh, we are very interested in access to the regulated market in, car in, in Canada that will probably pay us four to five times uh, a premium. And that we're waiting on the federal government and Environment and Climate Change Canada to bring the methodologies necessary uh, to allow us to put our carbon into the regulated market. And in the meantime, uh, we'll work with our farmers to develop uh, the types of methods and procedures that we need to put carbon um, on, the, uh, on the marketplace. So I wanted to run through um, a couple of slides. I don't know much about forest carbon. There's people in the room that um, know a tremendous amount about it, but I'm gonna take the last few minutes here and share with you what I've learned about agricultural carbon so that um, at the very least, when you hear these discussions about, about collaboration, when, when you hear about our net zero targets and, and agricultural carbon, um, you'll have an understanding perhaps of what it is that we have to accomplish and hopefully it'll be of some interest to you. So bear with me for a few minutes and, and I'll go through, go through a few things. Um, so your group is one of um, 17 commodity groups that make up the Prince Edward Island Federation of Agriculture and, as well as approximately um, 600 farmers. First couple of slides I stole from Brad. Uh, so we'll see how, see how that goes. But um, in any case, this is uh, the emissions makeup of Prince Edward Island. This is where they come from. Uh, agriculture accounts for 25% of, uh, of our emissions. And that's outsized compared to Canada, where it, uh, it accounts for only 10%. So the, the, the challenge of managing agricultural carbon is of greater importance in Prince Edward Island, uh, outsized importance. Uh, these are the targets that um, that the uh, provincial government has put in place for us. We really focused on that 2040 target, a 35 to 40 percent reduction in agricultural related emissions. And this is what our emissions profile looks like. So um, you often hear about diesel in the tractors. That makes up about 10 percent of our emissions. Because of the nature of greenhouse gases, uh, for instance in livestock, we're producing methane. Methane is 25 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So every ton of methane is worth 25 tons of carbon. When it comes to crop production, nitrogen fertilizer can give off nitrous oxide, and that's 300 times as powerful as a ton of carbon. So that's why when we think about uh, reducing our emissions in agriculture, we really think about livestock production, crop production, and when ultimately we get to the marketplace with our carbon, because those two questions are, are quite different in how we reduce those numbers, we will have a crop project, crop credits, we'll have a livestock project, livestock credits, uh, but again, it'll all be branded along with forestry uh, in, in sort of one, one, one brand um, of commodity of carbon from Prince Edward Island. This is, the, this is the makeup of the dominant crop systems in Prince Edward Island. Uh, this is work that was modeled by uh, a member of our team, Matt Ramsey, uh, who's a farmer in Hamilton. Uh, and we see potatoes here, forages, corn, uh, this helps us understand what's happening on the landscape, which ultimately helps us design strategies. Uh, we can also see which different, uh, which, which crop systems are putting carbon into the land and which crop, crop systems are pulling carbon out of the land. Uh, this will help us design reduction strategies. We can, we can design uh, crop rotations to maximize our ability to sequester carbon into the land. So I won't go through the details here, except that we have the information to advocate to design changes in our cropping system that allow us to make reductions. Potatoes are a critical part of our economy on Prince Edward Island. They are also, uh, you can't grow a no-till potato, so we're always going to be tilling the land when we grow potatoes. Tillage does reduce, or uh, does release carbon dioxide from the land, and so we have to manage the other years of the rotation to ensure that um, Again, sustainability is about economics and environmental, and I'm not here to risk uh, the economics in the name of the environmental, quite the opposite. This is what our emissions look like uh, if you graph them um, 
geospatially. Uh, we see, again, in our potato belts, uh, we do see more carbon coming uh, from our operations. Um, and again, we will work to uh, tailor our rotations. Uh, the types of research that are taking place on Prince Edward Island through the Living Labs program are going to make great strides in how we um, tailor those rotations to ensure that we're sequestering carbon in our soils rather than releasing them. For, for the cropping system, this is what our cumulative emissions look like. Again, potatoes, wheat, barley, they make up uh, the majority of where emissions are coming from. Um, and again, you see the intensity there, the numbers uh, represent the area. And uh, so again, this type of information, we're, we're lucky to have it. This is not information that every, uh, necessarily every um, province uh, has about their agriculture industry. And again, in order, to, in order to really manage carbon, we have to understand where it's coming from. To reduce carbon from cropping systems, we have four uh, major best management practices that we can choose from. Each of these create, um, have the ability to create carbon credits in Prince Edward Island, reduce nitrogen, cover cropping, uh, reduce tillage, and changes to the rotation length. And if you see um, the furthest, to the furthest right, you see two columns with numbers in them. The first, the model GHG, that tells me what we're actually producing in the landscape today. And then the furthest right, the literature tells me that for some of these BMPs, we can be performing quite a bit better. So if we, again, if we tailor our cover crops, if we tailor our rotation length, there's quite a bit of uh, carbon sequestration that can be unlocked. And these are the critical research questions that we have to answer uh, to maximize our ability to sequester carbon from agriculture and BEI. And ultimately, if we implement best management practices, we can take our uh, emissions from crop systems from 100,000 tons down to about 60,000 tons. So we can save about 40,000 tons by 2040 if we're aggressive, uh, if we reach the aggressive target of implementing those best management practices. As you'll see when we get to the livestock piece, 40,000 tons doesn't get us there. We need a reduction of about 105,000 tons uh, to give Brad what he wants. And, and you know, we definitely want to we want to do that. So 40,000 is good. Uh, it'll be great to get it in the, into the carbon markets and it help the farmers incentivize that, those changes. Uh, but without livestock, um, you know, we're not going to get there. So this is that same cumulative emissions. Beef and dairy cattle make up the majority of our emissions uh, from livestock on Prince Edward Island. Obviously, that, that, those are also where we see most of the livestock. But, uh, you know, we're very focused on cattle, how we manage cattle. Um, and, and we'll see that there's some major opportunities for reduction from livestock. <laughs> Best management practices uh, for livestock is really getting, getting the cattle back on the grass, getting it back into pasture uh, is, is a big time uh, climate best management practice. That's going to be critical. Uh, we're lucky to implement what's called the On-Farm Climate Action Fund, which is a $700 million federal fund designed to incentivize best practices in agriculture in Canada. Uh, and there are three, uh, again, reducing nitrogen cover cropping, and for livestock, we now support advanced grazing projects. So uh, a farmer who comes to us and wants to improve their grazing practice, get their cattle back on, on pasture, or improve the way that it uses pa they use pasture, uh, we can fund those projects up to 75%. So we're, we're equipped with capital to help the industry uh, become leaders in, in grazing, which is critical to reaching our climate targets. Some other things on here, managing manure is critical, um, both from because it, it's giving off emissions, but also if we can reincorporate it into, into the landscape, it can help us cut down on our nitrogen usage. Supplements are interesting on Prince Edward Island. That basically means feeding seaweed to cattle. And uh, there's trials happening on Prince Edward Island that. Uh, are really world class. We've seen New Zealand make great progress in, in, in feeding these types of supplements to cattle to limit methane, and we'll get there on PEI too quite quickly. And that'll become a nice little closed loop for us because we produce the seaweed as well. And so if we can get those implemented, we can cut our uh, emissions from cattle, uh, from, two, or from, from livestock from 200,000 down to 100,000 tons. And so that makes up two thirds of what we hope to accomplish uh, between now and 2040. So while the landscape may appear to be uh, more so cropping in Prince Edward Island. When it comes to emissions, you know, livestock are, are a critical, critical piece. 
And then this is time bound. You can't have a decent plan in five years. I gotta be able to look at this thing and say, are we doing it, are we not doing it? And I'm pleased to say that I've got that information. I can look, I can, in five years, I can look back and say, did we make progress, are we on track? And uh, we know that it won't be perfect. We have three different scenarios here. If we have moderate uh, uptake, we can still meet our goal of 105,000 tons. If we have uh, significant uptake of the best management practices, we can get to about 140,000 tons. And if we continue business as usual, we won't be able to achieve um, the targets that have been set from, by, by, um, by the government. So, you know, the goal is to use this on-farm on climate action fund to de-risk the adoption of best management practices, uh, help the farmer uh, adopt them. It, it, only, it only supports the adoption of the practices for the first year, and then we hope that the carbon market can pick that up and continue to incentivize the adoption of these practices in the long term. That's the, that's the vision for agriculture and, and climate on PEI, and we're very, very hopeful that we can work alongside forestry uh, to build the value proposition for our farmers and ensure that we're bringing uh, uh, landscape-wide carbon credits to the market. And that's it for me today, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald. Um, it's interesting that uh, uh, farmers, the agricultural sector, represent the greatest number of woodlot owners on PEI as a, as a, as a group. So uh, we look forward, the Woodlot Owners Association looks forward to uh, working very closely and more with uh, the Federation of Agriculture and other farm organizations as well.